Und das ist hier erstmal eigentlich der Entscheidung. And this is actually the crucial starting point. What can be seen at the level of survey research reflects a nuanced picture of the attitude towards arms deliveries in the German population. Broadly speaking, opinions are roughly balanced. So there are people who are fully in favor of delivering more weapons. We have had long discussions about individual types of weapons. The other half is skeptical and against it. One would actually expect this differentiation to be reflected in the political discourse, as it is also published in the media. However, what we have found is that this is precisely not the case. Hello and welcome to Neutrality Studies. My name is Pascal, and today I have the pleasure of discussing with two great German-speaking researchers. Here with me, on the one hand, is Professor Harold Welzer, one of the most significant German sociologists and social psychologists. While many of his scientific works deal with the influence of thinking or the inner self on society, Professor Welzer also repeatedly writes societal critical bestsellers like Turning Points, Politics Without a Model, Society in Danger, or The Fourth Estate, How Majority Opinion is Made. On the other hand, I also have a Swiss colleague here, namely Leo Keller, who is an entrepreneur and data scientist and has been researching opinions in media for decades. Last year, the two of them produced an excellent work titled The Published Opinion, a content analysis of German media coverage of the Ukraine war. In it, they critically examine the role of leading media in the war dynamics in Europe and show with many data points that our leading media are often more in the business of making opinions rather than reporting on them objectively. We want to discuss this research project today. Mr. Welzer, Mr. Keller, welcome. Hello, nice to be here. Thank you for taking the time. Perhaps we can start right away with the introduction of your paper. In the study, you explain how both of you came up with the idea to contrast the published opinion of people on the street with the published opinion in newspapers and other leading media. Could you perhaps briefly explain this episode? I don't know, Mr. Welzer. Was that perhaps your experience? Well, let's put it this way. We can indeed observe a relative discrepancy between what people record in surveys and what dominates the political and media discourse. We have observed this discrepancy over the past years. Initially, we identified it through the example of the population's approval of arms deliveries and the discourse in leading media about arms deliveries. If one makes this observation merely from personal experience as a media consumer, the accusation that this could be a subjective perception is of course justified. But after the publication of our results, it was often argued that the editorial teams work very differentiated and controversially and include all conceivable opinions. Therefore, that cannot be true. Therefore, there was now the opportunity to empirically investigate this through cooperation with Leo Keller. We wanted to find out if we were wrong. Was it actually just anecdotal knowledge that turned out to be false? Or does the content analysis confirm our suspected findings? Since the appropriate technology and know-how for this content analysis were available, it was a great thing for me, as a co-author of The Fourth Estate, to work with Mr. Keller and pursue this empiricism. Can we perhaps talk about that in detail? What did you find out in the study? Maybe you, Mr. Welzer, could answer that, and then, Mr. Keller, you could discuss the methodology. How did you approach the data? But first, Mr. Welzer, could you summarize that, please? I would even suggest that Mr. Keller first briefly explains the method so that one understands how we proceeded. Please. Yes, gladly. But I would like to look back briefly 
on how we came to systematically deal with the question of what published opinion is in comparison to public opinion. In this context, there was an interesting political incident in Switzerland. At the beginning of the 2010s, there was an initiative that wanted to ban minarets in Switzerland, the so-called Minaret Initiative. Opinion researchers believed that this would not pose a problem and that the initiative would be rejected with 55% no votes. However, the result of the vote was exactly the opposite. It was accepted with 55% of the votes, and that was the big shock. We then examined ex post and found that the published opinion was indeed as it was. However, the ratio in contributions on forums and Twitter, as well as in blogs, was completely different. And that also over time. That was very interesting. After the publication of our work, there was a certain resonance and also discussions with the responsible opinion researchers. One of them even lost his job at Swiss television in the long term. After this event, we began to systematically collect all documents in Switzerland. So we have quite a lot of experience with many issues that repeatedly show this discrepancy. Not in all cases, but it can be investigated. And therefore, inspired by the response to the work of Mr. Welser and Precht, we said, then we can do the same for the entire debate on the Ukraine crisis. We have set up a system in which we collect all documents that appear on the internet, both from newspapers and from social media, especially on Twitter. So everything that comes up on the topic of the Ukraine war, Putin, Zelensky, and whatever else, we have collected. We can say that we have essentially captured the entirety of all published opinions in newspapers, on television, as well as on blogs, in forums, and on Twitter. Over the course of a year, that amounts to about 20 million documents. Unlike traditional opinion research, which we also support in other projects, we can always work with the entirety of all documents and not just with a representative sample. In this way, it is possible to answer questions about how frequently certain topics, names, or aspects are discussed, how they are received, and in what context as well as in what tone they are discussed. So, just to understand, you have evaluated Twitter, YouTube, and other social media, but also daily newspapers and television broadcasts. In total, that's about 20 million documents that your system was able to evaluate. You have used this system before and now, a year and a half ago, applied it together with Mr. Welzer to the Ukraine war. Exactly, it continues. We have now collected the documents over 24 months, and it's still 20 million per year. So we are now at a total of 40 million documents. And then the question arises again, what has come out of the arms deliveries, for example? How does the published discourse compare to the public discourse? The difference is that the published discourse includes daily newspapers and official leading media, while the public discourse takes place on Twitter and other social media. These two have been contrasted with each other. I would differentiate that a bit more. Traditionally, one would say that the public discourse is also the one that is not necessarily reflected in the media. This is what people talk about at the dinner table, during encounters, or in the neighborhood, and so on. We always have an empirical reflection, for example, at the level of opinion polls. And this is the crucial starting point here. What can be seen at the level of survey research does reflect a nuanced picture of the attitude towards arms deliveries in the German population. Broadly speaking, it can be said that opinions are roughly balanced. So, there are people who are fully in favor of supplying more weapons. We have had long discussions about individual types of weapons and so on. The other half is skeptical and against it. 
Actually, it would be expected that this differentiation would be reflected in the political discourse as it is published in the media. However, what we have found is that this is not the case. Instead, there is a very strong vote in favor of arms deliveries in the leading media. There are always phases when this topic is particularly present. Dann beispielsweise, es gibt immer so Konjunkturen, wo das Thema hochkocht. In dem Fall waren es die Lieferungen von Kampfpanzern. In this case, it was the deliveries of battle tanks, a very present topic. One could observe that this topic is extremely favored in the leading media and thus does not reflect the differentiated picture in the population. Then one can examine to what extent the discourse in the leading media differs from that in social media. From my perspective, and that was also the core thesis of the fourth estate, the examination of the differences between published and public opinion is crucial. This is precisely why the leading media, as the fourth estate, have an eminently important function for the functioning of democracies. Among other things, they have the task of closing the political representation gap. This means they should introduce topics into the political discourse that are discussed in society. In democratic societies, press freedom ensures that the media can take on this role. The media should critically accompany politics. However, there are significant deficits in this respect. These were already observable during the refugee crisis of 2015 and 2016, as well as during the pandemic. These deficiencies are also evident in the reporting on the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine. The term reporting hardly seems appropriate anymore. Do you have an explanation for how such a strong discrepancy arises? It is perceived. I notice it in the YouTube comments, but also in conversations with friends and acquaintances. The subjective impression is created of being misled by the mainstream media, or that something is being sold to us. This is particularly noticeable with the arms deliveries. In Germany, it is interesting that Mr. Olaf Scholz's hesitation is repeatedly emphasized. It almost seems as if something is being sold to us, as if it were a PR campaign. Can you explain that? Although it is outside your study, how do you explain this behavior of the mainstream media? As a social psychologist, I would offer a very simple explanation. The historical events mentioned are crises. Crises have the unpleasant characteristic that one cannot see through the situation clearly. They are characterized by the fact that nobody has a script or screenplay. Nobody knows how the situation will develop or what the appropriate measures are. This leads to a situation of great dissonance. People would like to apply their knowledge and be able to say what the situation is and what needs to be done now. But in crises, this is not possible. Therefore, editors, newspaper makers, and so on, just like all other people, are faced with the problem of initially finding an interpretation of what is actually happening. In such an uncomfortable situation, people like to look for clues to hold on to in order to provide an interpretation. This is where basic group processes come into play. For example, the discussing editorial teams avoid their dissonance by developing a common interpretation that everyone can agree on. Then everyone is relieved because they now know how to proceed. Of course, there are also manifest traditions, for example, in the transatlantic perspective on events. There are dominances of certain actors, that's another factor. But now, these processes of agreement have been reached very quickly. These processes of agreement have an interesting psychological property. They are fragile. So the agreement was not made on the level of secured knowledge and secured data, but rather the group has somehow come to an agreement. Therefore, anything that comes as an intervention from the outside and says, wait a minute, that's not right. Or one could also see it differently. Or the experts who try to introduce a different opinion, 
are basically a disruptive factor for this fragilely established agreement. So, anyone who says, but that's not true, in a way disturbs this process. That's a crucial factor. In the course of this crisis development, one naturally deals with events that may also trigger feelings of disturbance. The paradox is that one does not pursue these feelings of disturbance, but fights them by further solidifying one's own opinion. You can see exactly that. While in everyday life, people are busy weighing things up a bit more and contrasting opinions. And there isn't so much the need to find something unanimous. That's actually very interesting when viewed neutrally. Das ist eigentlich sehr interessant, ähm, wenn man es neutral betrachtet. Wenn man es nicht neutral betrachtet, sondern sozusagen im Kontext... If you don't look at it neutrally, but in the context of crisis management, a huge problem arises. Because for crisis management, logically, you have to accumulate as much knowledge as possible to come to a solution that is as realistic as possible. However, if you systematically exclude the possibility that disturbances can influence the concept, this leads to systematically worse solutions than if you use the diversity and the amount of heterogeneous knowledge bases and opportunities for opinion formation that only democracies offer. The real disaster is that by foregoing this diversity, you obviously also favor bizarre and in the event of war, possibly very disastrous directions of decision making. It is an irrational process in a free liberal society, a process that leads to a kind of conformity, perhaps not of thought, but of reporting. Mr. Keller, do you have anything to add? Herr Keller, haben Sie etwas hier beizufügen? Yes, it's about measuring such things or detecting discrepancies. Today, thanks to access to online media, we can observe these very well. This can be easily implemented by looking at certain characteristics, such as the frequency with which the use of nuclear weapons is discussed, or who and how often talks about peace negotiations or a ceasefire. All these topics are relatively simple and therefore very meaningful analysis processes. They are not based on complex sentence analyses, but on the occurrence of certain terms, such as peace negotiations or ceasefire, which must be in a linguistic context related to the Ukraine war. And this technology, this semantic intelligence, can inform very well about it. The striking thing is that there is always, so to speak, a contrary image. When the topic of arms deliveries comes up in the published media, in the leading media, or in all online newspapers, then the topic of ceasefire is discussed more intensively in social media. When talking about nuclear weapons, especially about the possible use of nuclear weapons, without distinguishing whether one thinks it is good or bad, or considers it likely or unlikely, just the fact that it is being discussed leads to the topic of nuclear weapons being less present in social media, while the topic of peace negotiations receives more attention. Advocates for arms deliveries are strongly emphasized in published media and leading media outlets. The cautioners, including internationally recognized experts and unsuspected figures like Kissinger, are hardly mentioned there. In social media, on the other hand, the cautioners suddenly come to the forefront and are frequently discussed. It is not just a few individuals with a large reach, but a million different Twitter authors in the German-speaking area who comment on the Ukraine war. So that's a considerable number, while there are not so many journalists talking about it in the newspapers. So I think it shows a great representativeness of what is happening on social media. The interesting and, in a sense, also frightening thing is the consequence of this incongruity between the journalists and social media. Of these, we say that they are a good indicator of public discussion, as opposed to the published media, the leading media, and the 100,000 online newspapers. 
Medien, den Leitmedien und ähm, den 100.000 Online-Zeitungen. Herr Welzer, was denken Sie, was haben Mr. Welzer, how do you see the consequences of the fact that published opinion greatly differs from public opinion? On one hand, one could argue that newspapers do not always have to reflect what is being publicly discussed. They should provide quality, prepare content, and add new perspectives. On the other hand, this large discrepancy could lead to societal fractures. Especially the growing mistrust towards the media could be problematic. How do you assess this situation? I have already said it. I actually see this as very problematic. The eminently important function that the leading media have for opinion formation within the democratic discourse is not fulfilled if the reporting is so homogeneous, although the topic is actually heterogeneous. There are a number of studies from the past years that have examined foreign reporting in the German media. It is found that this hardly takes place, or it focuses on six or seven countries, even though there are nearly 200 in the world. The same findings apply to war reporting. The Ethiopia war, which was probably the deadliest war of the last few years, with casualty figures of about 400,000 dead, received little attention in our media. The same is true for the war in Yemen, which was only mentioned sporadically. It was only when the Houthi militias attacked the cargo routes that the conflict became somewhat more present in the media. The coverage increased when the German Navy dispatched a frigate to combat the attacks. Nevertheless, this war, with an estimated 300,000 dead, played hardly any role in the media landscape. And many other things that happen in the world, which consist not only of Germany, Switzerland, France, or the USA, but also of many other countries, are not mentioned. This is particularly problematic when considering how a geopolitical development is viewed. One can only analyze it adequately if one includes knowledge from other parts of the world and appropriately assesses the situations in their ambivalences, conflict potentials, but also alliance possibilities. This is exactly what one should expect from media that employ foreign correspondents and claim to report in a differentiated and comprehensive manner. Natürlich differenziert und umfassend zu versuchen zu berichten und alles das erweist sich als erstaunlich. And all this proves to be remarkably deficient. You also asked about the reasons for this development earlier. I only mentioned the socio-psychological reason. Of course, there are also economic reasons. Since advertising expenditures have shifted heavily to internet publications, social networks, and so on, traditional editorial offices have been under enormous financial pressure. This has also led to cost savings, which of course then also resulted in losses in quality in many respects. So keywords are editorial, foreign correspondence, and research efforts, and so on. And the third point, which is also painfully experienced, concerns the consequences for the social climate, which you have already pointed out. We have seen that in the fight for attention and reach, the way of expression has also changed in the leading media. Unfortunately, these media have adopted certain behaviors from social networks. This means they express disgust, rejection, and devaluation towards certain positions without giving them room to unfold. You don't even know exactly what you are opposing. That's very interesting. So, and that is so interesting. And it becomes almost funny when you see which terms have become popular. So for me, for example, it's interesting. We haven't systematically studied this, but everyone is always horrified. It's totally absurd. When the Pope recently spoke of a white flag that one would need courage to wave in an interview where the interviewer's question wasn't even addressed, all the headlines were horrified about the Pope. Why should one be horrified about the Pope when he, according to his job description, believes that peace is better than war? But no, people are horrified. 
Another word from this lexicon is dumbfounded. People are always dumbfounded. Fassungslos. Man ist immer fassungslos. Ja, man ist nicht, keine Ahnung, bereit, etwas zu diskutieren. People are not willing to discuss something because they are already flabbergasted or horrified from the outset. These exaggerated terminologies limit the possibility of discourse. Because if one is already horrified by a statement, how should they take it seriously or consider whether there might be some truth to it? Unfortunately, the opinion is often there before an analysis has taken place. This leads to many in editorial offices being afraid to express a dissenting opinion for fear of provoking astonishment. An example of this is the reaction to the parliamentary group leader of the Social Democrats in the Federal Republic, who everyone was horrified by because he mentioned the possibility of freezing the war in a speech. We lack an argumentative and discursive basis to judge whether this is a viable option or not. In an enlightened society, the goal should actually be to discuss what the best understanding, interpretation and conclusion is. However, this is systematically avoided when trying to lead a discourse only emotionally and normatively, instead of on the basis of knowledge and arguments. Versuche an Diskurs zu führen und nicht argumentativ auf der Basis von Wissen. Das ist eben der Punkt, wo es dann so scheint, dass... That's exactly the point that gives the impression of being sold something when these words keep coming up. From your study, I concluded that very strong epistemic groups, or bubbles, seem to form here. I briefly discussed this with Mr. Keller last week. Mr. Keller, you don't quite agree with the idea that bubbles are forming here, do you? Would you like to respond to that? How do you assess it? Yes, the topic of the bubble, meaning the idea that a self-referencing community develops on the internet, I would very much question compared to the time before the internet. I mean, back then you were much more trapped in very narrow bubbles. You were either in Switzerland a consumer of the Tagesanzeiger as a liberal Swiss or of the NZZ as a conservative Swiss, and there was no possibility at all to really inform oneself in a differentiated way through other channels. But I think here we are not dealing so much with the problem of self-referencing information loops, but with the fact that certain debates are simply not happening anymore. And I experience this in my professional and private environment, this irritation. Whether it's about the Ukraine war, Corona, or the Gaza crisis, the stance in the published opinion is very clear. And those who deviate from it face real problems, up to professional consequences. This frightens many people. That means the discussions I have in private are completely different from those that take place in the published media world. They are worried, nuanced, and searching. And that has really convinced me of what you, Mr. Welser, have said. Das hat mich sehr überzeugt von dem, was Sie, Herr Welser, gesagt haben, oder das, das Dilemma, wenn man in eine Situation gerät. The dilemma arises when one finds oneself in a situation where there are no clear solutions and everyone is searching. The pressure to quickly eliminate this dissonance leads to the attempt to recognize one opinion as the correct one in order to quickly clear away uncertainties and associated disturbances, such as objections, criticism or counter-arguments. This clarity surprised me, and I would be very interested in examining this more closely. I believe this is possible. Overall, however, I think that today, thanks to the internet, people are able to inform themselves very differentiatedly. This can also be seen in their reactions on social media, which are often very nuanced, searching and weighing. And that's why, I'll say it, the people, the warners, and the skeptics are quoted much more frequently there, so they are mentioned. I'll take John Mearsheimer and Henry Kissinger as two unsuspecting American witnesses who have a clearly different view in this war. They are virtually ignored in the traditional media here in this German-speaking world, but not in the social media of the German-speaking world. And this shows me that social media is almost a way to break out of the bubble of the respective published channels, be it FADS, Spiegel, RTL, Zeit, NZZ, or whatever. <laughs>
Selbstrezept oder wie auch immer, ähm, aus diesen Bubbles auszubrechen. My great fear as a scholar of international relations is that there is not just a downward feedback loop, but also an upward one, and that newspapers and governments could influence each other so that a dynamic develops. Mr. Welzer, do you feel that the way of reporting contributes to the escalation of the war, or how do you see the connection to the decision makers? It is very difficult to judge because we do not know the causal chains. But I argue from a baseline that I have already mentioned. For political decision makers, it is highly relevant to receive and evaluate heterogeneous information. If they only get homogeneous information, their decision making basis is weaker than if they had access to a variety of information. Therefore, it can be said that it is at least an unfavorable development. We wish that the knowledge base, which becomes the basis of decisions, is as comprehensive as possible. In a democracy, we have exactly the possibilities for this that do not exist under dictatorial or authoritarian conditions. Ansonsten unter diktatorischen oder autoritären Verhältnissen einfach nicht gibt. Die sind systematisch homogenisierend. Wir wollen ja eigentlich heterogenisieren. The media are systematically homogenizing. However, we strive for heterogeneity because that is the actual strength of our form of society. The question arises to what extent leading media are able to actually influence political decisions. This would probably have to be examined in longitudinal studies to determine whether peaks in reporting actually lead to a German or Austrian chancellor making certain decisions. I would say, it is sufficient to argue on this basic level and say that it is unfavorable when this homogenization takes place. Perhaps one last question to both of you. What are your recommendations for the viewers of this channel who want to get comprehensive information? Where would you say should they go? How is that done now in the year 2024? I personally am not inclined towards social networks. Therefore, I do not get my information directly from them, but at most secondarily or tertiarily. For me, it is important to also follow international press and read corresponding articles. In doing so, one realizes that there is a greater heterogeneity in the perception of these conflicts than it initially seems. Moreover, I find everyday conversation very important. We all, as ordinary citizens, are always in search of orientation and interpretation. Other people are always carriers of information for us, both positively and negatively. This means I do not have to agree immediately with everything that is said, but it is important for me to know what is being said. Was da so gesagt wird. Und ich würde einen Punkt sehr, sehr stark machen, mache ich auch in die. And I emphasize one point very strongly, which I also make in every public discussion. We are very fortunate in Switzerland, Germany, and Austria to have enlightened populations. These consist mostly of thinking people. This is the strongest resource for democracies. It is regrettable that there is a form of published opinion that is homogenized while the actual resource, the thinking and discussing citizens, who also articulate themselves in Germany through demonstrations against the right, is very much alive, in contrast to a rather silenced public opinion. And that is problematic. You asked for it, hence my wish. Politics should acknowledge that there lies an important resource, Especially when it comes to fighting populist movements, one can see that the established parties in Germany often have no strategy. That's why people protest in the streets, quasi on behalf of politics. In this sense, the political class could also better inform themselves about the potentials, resources, and productive contradictions that exist within the population and are expressed in the conducted discourses. Very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Keller. From this internet world, very few people have a system available to them on how to use it 
by evaluating the entirety of all Twitter data. That's why I think there are three recommendations for the general population who wants and can navigate the internet to some extent. The first is to look for blogs by professionals. In the USA, there are millions of blogs, and the authors are mostly experts in their topic. Today, some of them have their own YouTube channels, just like we do. It's astonishing how many experts regularly speak on YouTube about their respective topics, be it Gaza, Ukraine, artificial intelligence, or the climate crisis. So you find very interesting people who are no longer mentioned in the newspapers today. And then I think it's also very helpful to look at international media. I am amazed to see how much more critical the American, including the mainstream newspapers, are of the Ukraine war than our mainstream newspapers. I am equally amazed at how critically Haaretz reports on the Gaza war. This opens our eyes, especially when what the German-speaking media no longer provide in terms of international correspondence is sought out by ourselves. Yes, for that you need to be able to speak English or master another foreign language. When it comes to texts, they can now be excellently translated automatically via DeepL. So I think if you look around, you can find alternative information, be it through the small dissident channels that exist in all countries or via international platforms like YouTube. And as mentioned, every newspaper today publishes significantly more content online than they do in their print editions. The most famous example is the Washington Post, which publishes six to seven times more online articles than appear daily in their print editions. So, I think the internet is really a very good information platform for getting diverse information. Look for yourself. Think for yourself. Mr. Welser, the last word goes to you. Would you like to add anything or make a recommendation? Yes, because you just mentioned this wonderful self-thinking. I even wrote a book with this title once, although the title actually sounds absurd. What is really important is to take self-thinking very seriously. So, something very important in self-thinking is identifying contradictions. Let me mention a contradiction that is totally interesting. In media perception, it seems completely clear that everything can be expected of Putin. Absolutely everything, and he has always proven that he is capable of anything. But when it comes to the question of nuclear war, then everyone is sure that he would never do that. And this is something that one doesn't even need to have studied for. You don't even need a high school diploma to say, wait, there might be a contradiction here. And the contradictions are exactly what stimulate thinking people to think further. There is something very productive in it. I experience this in everyday conversations, which I have already mentioned. Then someone like me, a social scientist, is asked if I can explain it because I am more knowledgeable. That's exactly where thinking, independent thinking, and further thinking begins. And I consider that enormously important. Otherwise, there is a tendency to smooth over contradictions as much as possible. I emphasize again that they are an enormously important methodological resource for democracy. Since life is contradictory, one must endure these contradictions and in a certain sense think further. I find that very good and would like to emphasize that Mr. Descartes deconstructed the whole world with the method of doubt. One does not need to go that far, but using doubt systematically to question is a good idea. Mr. Welser, Mr. Keller, thank you for the discussion. Very welcome. Thank you very much. Sehr gerne. Danke sehr. Thank you.